Thank you for joining us around the fire. For more information or to make a donation, please visit randomactsnetwork.com. Now, want to hear a scary story? It started as a normal day. It was chilly, and Haddington's only department store was gearing up for the Black Friday rush to begin at 6 a.m. sharp. The store's customers were known to pound on the doors before opening even on a regular day, so the staff knew to be prepared for the worst. Or so they thought. First in line was an older woman, Margot, steaming cup of tea in hand. Everyone at the store knew Margot. She always had something to complain about, some expired coupon to demand using. She remarked to those near her in the line that she expects a store to let everyone wait inside until the sales start if they valued them as customers. Nobody responded. Further back in the line was a father and his son, Toby. Toby's dad was headed to the electronics to find a flat screen TV, but Toby would be headed to the toys to get that remote control car he'd seen all the commercials for. Behind them was Tina, a single woman in her early 30s. She planned to hit every department she could, and she had her list ready. As the sun rose, the crowd grew more and more impatient. A few minutes before the doors opened, the speakers kicked on and a cheerful Christmas tune echoed through the parking lot. The energy shifted as the customers watched the employees make their final preparations through the windows. And then, the doors separated. The sign lit up. The store was now open. Margot used her bony elbows to make sure nobody beat her to the discounted purses she had her eyes on. She grabbed several, leaving very few for anyone else and began to head back to the registers. Toby hadn't seen his father since the first few seconds in the store, and he couldn't see anything in the massive stampede of adults. Though he was overwhelmed, he kept his mind on that car. Tina had planned to go to electronics first, but as she entered the anarchy of the store, she made the swift decision that her father's gift would come first. The newest, biggest capacity, shiniest blender you can get. She squeezed her way through the crowd towards the appliances. These were the final moments that resembled anything like a typical Black Friday. Margot made it to the register first and plopped the bags down without saying a word. After the final bag was scanned, she took out her credit card to pay. Was it a gust of wind? Or maybe it was her frail, wrinkly hands. Something happened, and she dropped the card. As she bent over to grab it from the floor, her gaudy necklace triggered the conveyor belt to move forward. Her entire body lurched towards the cashier, who screamed and grabbed at the jewelry to no avail. Margot desperately grabbed at her throat to remove the necklace, but it was too tight. She was flailing, choking, desperate to breathe. Her face turned from white to red to purple, and she flailed less and less. The conveyor belt kept pulling and pulling. The gears chewed past the necklace and began feasting on her wrinkly skin. In a matter of seconds, her entire face was pulled off like a sticky Halloween mask, squishing into the gears and spraying blood in every direction. Finally, the belt caught the gray hair. She had pulled into a bun and removed it at once disappearing into the machine like it hadn't eaten in days. For a moment, the rest of her lingered there, half collapsed by the register. From the shoulders up, she was nothing but bloody bone, other than her eyes, which made piercing contact with those screaming around her. But the rest of the store was distracted, because it wasn't just the conveyor belt that suddenly became deadly. It was everything. The motorized scooters near the entrance had started driving around aimlessly, mowing down whatever and whoever was in their paths. Back in the appliances, nearly everything had turned on at once. 
Hands and faces were filleted away by blenders and electric knives. Shelves collapsed, littering the floor with butcher knives and cheese graters, ready to destroy whatever flesh found its way to them. Everywhere, bloody bodies tripped and tangled with each other. Tina could see all this happening from the frozen food aisle. She hadn't made it to appliances yet when it all started happening, and now she stood in the middle of the freezer section. She was desperate to find a way to escape a store where everything had seemingly come to life with the desire to kill. Toby was in the toys with a few other kids when it all started happening. Heavy boxes were lurching from the shelves, the toys loudly honking and singing and reciting whatever program lines they had. Shortly before this all happened, Toby had made eye contact with a cute young girl on the other side of the aisle near the dolls. Now he watched as she was swiftly crushed by the child's playset that had suddenly come crashing down from the display over the aisle. Toby had to get to his dad. He turned around to find a way out of the aisle when he stopped in his tracks. Ten feet away was a fleet of remote control cars. Although no one was controlling them, of course. Normally, they looked fun and exciting. Now they were menacing. Toby wasn't a big kid, and with so many of them, he didn't stand a chance. As they sped towards him, he turned and ran as fast as he could quickly hitting the dead end that was created by the falling playset. He tried to find a way to climb it, but he couldn't find anything to hold. At the very last second, Toby jumped onto the shelf, holding onto the metal prongs that normally displayed trading cards. The cars slammed into the playset with exploding bits of metal and plastic flying in every direction. That was close. Toby climbed to the top of the shelf and observed the crowd. He immediately knew he was never finding his father. Tina had finally left the freezer section, but now found herself near the produce. It seemed like the best route to the front doors. She didn't notice that the automatic sprayers above the fruit had gone into hyperdrive, soaking everything around them. Crying, she climbed past overturned carts and the bodies of those run down by the scooters. She didn't see the puddle ahead of her and her foot slipped the second and attempted touchdown. She landed hard on her back, immediately soaked. A few feet away, the water found its way to the tongue of an extension cord. Tina was killed instantly, along with the dozens of others who were attempting to cross the water or touching anything metal nearby. Toby stood at the front of the aisleway, seeing people trampling over each other, breaking bones and cracking skulls against the floor. The entire grocery section was sparking and crackling, and dozens of bodies trembled in a disturbing electric dance. The sparks were starting to reach the dry goods. Toby knew it was a matter of moments before there would be a fire. His dad would expect him to get out. It would be impossible to try to find him now. Toby surveyed the bloodshed once more, trying to predict the best route of exit. Only then did he notice the people strung up to the ceiling like ornaments tangled in the Christmas lights with blue and purple faces. Were the objects moving? If he didn't go now, he'd never make it. He'd have to use his small size to his advantage. He reached over and untangled a string of lights from the display of bodies and wrapped the cord up in his hands. He jumped from the aisle top, swinging above the panicked customers desperately trying to escape. He let go at the last possible second and hit the tile only a few feet from the registers. On his left, he could see straight into the garden center, though he wished he had never looked. The mowers and saws were having a holiday of their own. The walls were painted deep red, and mangled limbs and dismembered bodies decorated the ground. Toby stayed low, crawling under the registers. He wanted to do nothing more than to stand up and sprint, but he had no idea what was waiting for him past the checkout area. It was getting really warm and harder to breathe. The fire was starting to consume the back half of the store. Toby cleared the registers and stood fully up for the first time. The sliding glass doors were right there, opening and closing quickly like the jaws of a giant metal monster. 
he picked up a long piece of metal shelf from the floor and started running. Whatever came flying at him, he batted it away with his makeshift shield. Without ever meaning to, he was screaming as loud as he could. As he made it to the entrance, he threw the shelf into the angry doors, causing a temporary jam. He turned and yelled for others to follow that the doors were open. But there was no one even close. He ran through the doors and kept going until he got to the very last parking space and collapsed, coughing and crying in the freezing cold morning air. He looked around the parking lot. Other than the violent noises leaking from the store, the outside felt rather normal. A gentle snow fell from the sky and Toby knew that his father was already dead. There were only a few survivors. They all told the same story, but it didn't matter. Authorities called it a group hallucination caused by smoke inhalation. The store had simply caught on fire, they said, and most of the customers died in a panic trying to get out. But the survivors knew better, and Haddington outlawed Black Friday after that. The official word was that it was out of respect for the hundreds who died, but those who knew the truth understood it was a way of making sure it never happened again. But of course, they couldn't be sure of that. Toby turned and left the parking lot, walking along the barren sidewalk towards home. Police cars passed him on their way to the store. He could hear the fire trucks in the distance. As he rounded the corner into his cul-de-sac, it was nearly silent. The fluffy snow acted as a sponge to the sound, and Toby could only hear the crunching below his sneakers. What was he going to tell his mom? But then, he started hearing something else. A familiar, high-pitched, electric hum. Breathing deep, he turned around. Just behind him was a remote control car, ready to hit the gas. Black Friday, written by Brian Renaud, told by Shannon Lee Weber. It was the first big snow of the season, and the streets were filled with neighbors plowing sidewalks and roads, and the occasional kids having snowball fights. Jack had gotten held up at work, and he knew his partner wasn't going to be happy that he'd be so late for dinner. They were hosting friends, and Jack had promised he'd be there with enough time to help set up. He missed the bus, so the quickest route home would be to walk. He cut through the alleyway behind his work building as he dialed Brandon's number to let him know he'd be late. Hey, this is Brandon. I can't answer the phone, so please. No answer. Jack thrust his phone and freezing hand back into his pocket and continued walking into the winter storm. After a few minutes, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. The city was nearly silent, all sounds getting sucked into the snow, but every once in a while, he swore he heard the unmistakable squish of a boot stepping into fresh snow. The first few times he looked around, he couldn't spot anyone. At some point, almost everyone had gone indoors. The thrill of the first big winter storm was now outweighed by the bitter winds and dark night. Finally, when Jack was certain of the stepping noises coming from behind him, he turned around. He had been walking down a long, straight stretch of sidewalk, and a few hundred feet away was the outline of a slender figure, almost impossibly tall. In the whipping winds and snow, he couldn't see much else. He wasn't even positive the person was actually there, but he didn't feel the need to find out for sure. As he turned around, picking up the pace, he called Brandon again. This time, he answered. Hey, where the hell are you? I'm sorry. Look, I called before. I was stuck at work, but I'll be there in ten. Is everything alright? 
Of course. Are Stacy and Nick there? Just got here. They can't wait to see you. Are you sure everything is okay? Yeah, it's just fucking freezing out here. Can't see anything. I kept thinking... I kept thinking someone was following me. He turned around looking deeply in the direction of the stranger. There was no one there. I think I'm just tired. Do you want me to stay on the phone with you? No, no. Go talk to them. I'll see you in a few. Okay, love you. Love you. Jack put his phone away once again and glanced back over his shoulder. He was still alone. Had there been anyone there at all? It had been such a long day and his eyes were tired. The blizzard would only add to the delusion. He trudged on, walking a few more blocks before he was certain, once again, that he could hear someone following him. He turned around quickly, projecting his best look of anger, but it dropped from his face, as the stranger was now only a few feet away. His sunken face towered at least two feet higher than Jack's, the giant eyes fixed directly on him. The stranger was as thin and gaunt as a skeleton in tattered winter clothes. Jack was frozen for a moment, taken aback. The stranger slowly revealed a long, distorted smile. Why are you following me? The stranger said nothing. He only continued smiling in that disturbing way. I'll call the police, asshole! Jack turned back around, hoping to God the threat would get this guy off his back. But before he could take another step, the stranger said, Do you want to build a snowman? Jack sighed. Just another weirdo who wasn't even worth a response. He began walking once again, stepping quickly through the fresh snow. He didn't have too much longer to go. It was quickly obvious that the stranger was still trailing him, and finally he turned back around. Sure enough, the man was only a few feet away. Do you want to build a snowman? No, okay? No thank you. No. Have a good night. The man's gaping eyes stared back with a terrifying emptiness. Jack continued walking. He hated having his back to the man, but it didn't make sense to stop moving. At the next intersection, he'd normally keep going straight, but he decided to take a left and go an extra block out of the way. Jack knew in his gut he was still being followed, and didn't want the stranger to be anywhere near his house. The city was a frozen ghost town. Jack trekked every driveway, every porch, hopeful someone would be outside shoveling or clearing their car, anyone to distract this creep so he could just get home. The end of the block was nearing, and he heard the crunching of snow right behind him. Taking a deep breath, Jack whipped around, almost face to face with the horrifying stranger. Just leave me the fuck alone, okay? Fuck off, you fucking freak! For the first time, the stranger's smile melted from his face. Jack shivered in the cold. He just wanted to get home. Brandon had just served his guests a second round of drinks when he called Jack's phone hoping for an update. Putting on his coat and boots, Brandon stepped out onto the porch. The winter air whipped his face like the back of a hand, and so much snow fell at once he couldn't see further than three or four feet away. Jack could be in serious trouble. Brandon stepped off the porch and into the yard. Near the street, he could make out the shape of a figure. Jack? They didn't respond, but who else could it be? Brandon continued through the yard, a nearly impossible task in the storm, and the figure came more into view. Brandon realized the shape was much bigger than a normal person. A mass formed by mounds of snow. Finally, he realized that he was looking at a haphazardly made snowman. Clumps of dirt and snow stuck together to create three layers, though they were hardly distinct. The center was horrifyingly decorated with three buttons. Though instead of coal, they were human toes, black in the cold. Emerging out of each side was a long stick, On the ends, two severed hands, wearing Jake's gloves, dripping fresh blood into the snow below. Brandon's eyes continued upwards. The snowman smiled back with a half-circle of bloody teeth, chunks of gum and root still attached. Above, two disembodied eyes stared back, optic nerves dangling in the wind. Jack's eyes... Brandon doubled over, getting sick into the snow. He was dizzy, feeling faint. The wind whipped against his skin. He reached into his pocket, realizing he'd left his phone inside. Suddenly, he heard movement behind him. 
the sound of snow being crushed beneath boots. Do you want to build a snowman? A Snowman Written by Brian Renaud Told by Ashlyn C. Hafer Featuring Aaron Holland and Brian Renaud Have you met the Sangstons? They are cousins of mine and they live in Surrey. Five years ago, they invited me to go and spend Christmas with them. It was an old house, with lots of unnecessary passages and staircases. A stranger could get lost in it quite easily. Well, I went down for that Christmas. Violet Sangston promised me that I knew most of the other guests. Unfortunately, I couldn't get away from my job until Christmas Eve. All the other guests had arrived there the previous day. I was the last to arrive, and I was just in time for dinner. The introductions were swift. At dinner, I noticed a tall, dark-haired, handsome woman I hadn't met before. She didn't look at all friendly. More cold and clever. Interesting. I wondered who she was, but I didn't ask. I was sure someone would speak to her by name during the meal. However, I was a long way from her at the table, and the conversation was bright and amusive. I completely forgot to ask the woman's name. There were twelve of us, including the Sangstons. We were all young, or trying to be young. Jack and Violet Sangston were the oldest, and their seventeen-year-old son Reggie was the youngest. It was Reggie who suggested Smee when the talk turned to games. He told us the rules of the game. The name comes from It's Me, of course. Every player is given a sheet of paper. All the sheets except one are blank. On the last sheet of paper is written Smee. Nobody knows who Smee is except Smee himself, or herself. You turn out the lights, and everyone goes quietly out of the room and hides. Everyone is charged with looking for Smee, but of course you don't know who you're looking for. When one player meets another, he challenges them by saying, Smee. The other player answers, Smee, and they continue searching. He went on. But the real Smee doesn't answer when someone challenges. The second player quietly stands beside him. When they are discovered by a third player, they will challenge and receive no answer, and they will join the first two. This goes on until all the players are in the same place. The last to find Smee forfeits the game. It's very amusing. In a big house, it often takes a long time for everyone to find me. As Reggie finished, Violet Sangston stepped forward with a warning. If you're going to play games in the dark, please be careful of the back stairs on the first floor. A door leads to them. We've always talked about taking the door off. In the dark, a stranger would think that they were walking into a room. You could get really hurt. A girl broke her neck falling down those stairs. Reggie. Tell them how it happened. She was apprehensive. But if she didn't tell the story, Reggie surely would. It was ten years ago, before we moved in. There was a party and all the children were playing hide-and-seek. A girl was looking for somewhere to hide and she heard someone coming, so she started to run to get away. She opened the door, assuming it led to a bedroom, but it was the door that led to the back stairs. She nearly jumped and landed at the foot of the stairs, killed instantly. The room was quiet with uneasiness, but none of us had known her. It wasn't right to feel sad on Christmas Eve. We promised to be safe. We started the game immediately after dinner. Reggie went around turning all the lights off, except in the sitting room where we were. We prepared the twelve sheets of paper, eleven of them were blank, and one of them had Smee written on it. 
Reggie mixed them up, and we each took one. I looked at mine and saw that it was blank. A moment later, the lights were turned out, and I heard someone moving very quietly to the door. The rest of us waited for a minute before rushing from the room. I had no idea who Smee could be. For five or ten minutes, we were all rushing up and down the passages, in and out of rooms, challenging each other and answering, Smee? Smee? After a while, the noise had died down. I guess that someone had found Smee. Finally, I came across a group of people sitting on some narrow stairs. Smee? I asked. I received no answer. So Smee was there. I joined the group just as two other players arrived. Each hurried, neither wanting to be last. Jack Sangston was last and forfeited with laughter. That's everyone, isn't it? Reggie lit a match and held it up to the staircase. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. He shook his head, laughing. That's one too many. The match went out. He lit another and counted again. He got to twelve, and his forehead creased with confusion. There are thirteen people here. Oh, nonsense, Mrs. Gorman laughed. You probably began with yourself, and now you're counting yourself twice. Someone handed him a flashlight, which was much bigger than the match. We all counted as a group. Of course there were twelve of us. Reggie laughed. Well, I was sure I counted thirteen twice. From halfway up the stairs, Violet spoke nervously. I thought that there was someone just here, sitting two steps above me. Have you moved, Bernadette? Bernadette shook her head no. The air shifted as a cold finger seemed to touch us all. We felt generally uncomfortable and unpleasant, momentarily unsure of what to do. And then we laughed at ourselves and each other and felt normal again. There were twelve of us, and that was that. Still laughing, we went back to the sitting room and started again. This time, I was Smee. Violet found me while I was still searching for a hiding place. That game didn't last long. As we prepared for another round, Reggie pulled me aside. I've got to talk to you. We went into the breakfast room. What's the matter? I asked. I don't know. You were Smee last time, weren't you? I nodded. Well... Of course, I didn't know who Smee was. Mother and the others ran to the west side of the house and found you. But I went east into a bedroom. There's a deep clothes cupboard. It's a great hiding place. I thought Smee might be there. I opened the door in the dark, and I could see the outline of someone there, behind the hanging clothes. I reached in and touched their hand. Smee? I asked. There was no answer, so I thought I found Smee. I went in and closed the door, and... I can't describe it. I suddenly had a strange, cold feeling, like something was wrong. I I turned on my flashlight, and I was alone in the cupboard. But I am sure I touched a hand, and nobody could get in or out because I was standing there. You imagined you touched a hand, I said. I knew you would say that. Of course I imagined it. (laughs) That's the only explanation, isn't it? I could see he still felt shaken, but I agreed with him and together we returned to the sitting room. The others were all ready and waiting to start again. Perhaps it was my imagination, but as we played this round, I had a feeling that nobody was really enjoying the game anymore, but everyone was too polite to mention it. I had a deep, uneasy feeling. I tried to laugh at myself, but I did not succeed. At first, I stayed close to the others, but for several minutes, no Smee was found. I left the group and started searching the first floor to the west of the house. I was feeling my way along the wall in the pitch dark when I bumped into a pair of human knees. My hand touched a soft, heavy curtain. I knew where I was. There were tall windows with seats at the end of the passage, with curtains touching the ground. Someone was sitting in the corner of the window. Smee? I whispered. There was no answer. So I sat down beside her to wait for the others. That's when I realized I knew who this was. It was that tall, pale, dark woman from before. 
I'm sorry. I never caught your name before, I said. After a moment, she whispered, Bailey Ford. She was taking the game very seriously, I thought. I whispered an introduction back, but she didn't respond. I asked another one or two rather ordinary questions and received no answer. I began to feel a little annoyed. Smee is a game of silence, but there was nobody else around. Why was she insisting on keeping quiet? I turned away from her. I hope someone finds us soon, I thought to myself. As I sat there, I realized that I disliked sitting beside this girl very much indeed. Before, I had wanted to know more about her. But now, I felt really uncomfortable beside her. I trembled, wanting to jump up and run away. I prayed that someone else would come along soon. Finally, I heard light footsteps in the passage. I heard the curtains move, and a hand touched my shoulder. Smee! It was Mrs. Gorman. Of course, we didn't answer. She sat beside me, and at once I felt much better. You're not Smee, are you? No, she's on my other side. Mrs. Gorman reached across me, setting her hand on the woman's silk dress. Hello, Smee. How are you? Of course, the woman didn't answer. Oh, it's against the rules to talk. Never mind, then. You know, this game is beginning to annoy me a little. I hope we're not going to play it all evening. I'd rather switch to a nice quiet game, all together by a nice warm fire. Me too, I agreed. Can you suggest it when we return? I'm sure I'm being very silly, but I can't get rid of the idea of the extra person on the stairs. Somebody who ought not to be here at all. That's exactly how I felt. But I didn't say so. Hmm, I wonder when the others will find us. After a time, we heard the sound of feet, and finally Reggie's voice. Is anybody there? We're here, I answered. Is Miss Gorman with you? Yes. You've both got forfeits. You've kept us all waiting for hours. But you haven't found Smee, I complained. What are you on about? I was Smee this time. But Smee is here with us. Reggie ignited his flashlight, shining it directly onto Mrs. Gorman and myself. Between me and the wall was an empty space on the window seat. I stood up, but sat back down again. The room was spinning. There was somebody there. I said, because I touched her. Mrs. Gorman was trembling. So did I. And I don't think anyone could leave this seat without us knowing. Reggie seemed to shrug it off. We were not very popular upon our return to the sitting room. I found them in the window seats. The tall, dark girl was by the fire. I approached her. So you were pretending to be Smee and then you went away? She laughed, bewildered. Mrs. Sangston approached me. The two of you kept everyone waiting. It was very rude. But we were not alone, I protested. There was somebody else there. She was pretending to be Smee. I thought it was her. I pointed to the tall, dark woman. But she's refused to admit it. It couldn't have been Charlotte. I was with her the entire time. Charlotte? I exclaimed. She told me her name was Bailey Ford. Violet Sangston went as pale as a ghost. Bailey Ford? I confirmed. The cold wind whipped against the windows. That was the girl that fell down the stairs and died ten years ago. Her name was Bailey Ford. Me, written by A. M. Burridge, adapted by Brian Renaud, told by Samantha Garcia, featuring Erin Holland, Shannon Lee Weber, and Ashlyn C. Hafer.
It was the Robinson's first Christmas in the new house and the girls were more excited about the holiday than ever. They'd picked the biggest tree they could find and festive decorations covered nearly every inch of the house. James and Brandon were looking forward to spoiling their daughters with dozens of gifts. The most exciting part? They were planning to catch Santa in the act. They sat the girls down and explained that they'd aim their nanny cam towards the tree on Christmas Eve to try and catch Santa Claus delivering presents. Brandon was planning to dress up and eat the cookies and really put on a show for the kids. He had been a theater major after all before his days at the office. Christmas Eve came and Christy and Ashley excitedly placed the cookies they had baked for Santa onto the snowflake plate. They were practically begging to go to sleep well before their bedtime, so eager to reach Christmas morning. We can't forget the milk. Ashley had come into the living room with a pint of oat milk. Will that kind work? Santa won't even know the difference. In fact, his tummy will probably thank us. Brandon balanced the reindeer mug for Ashley as she cautiously filled it. She set it down on the end table near the tree next to the plate of cookies. It's going to be the best Christmas ever, but only if you get a good night's sleep. And promise to stay in bed. The girls were tucked in, and Brandon and James headed to the bedroom to finish wrapping gifts. They had really gone all out this year, so they needed every last minute of alone time to prepare for Christmas morning. Finally, they loaded up the big red bag they bought online, and Brandon got into costume. It was time for his big act. James watched from the hallway so he wouldn't be on camera as Brandon tiptoed into the room. He unloaded gift after gift until the tree was totally surrounded with presents and stopped to eat a cookie and drink some milk before taking his bag and leaving. It was well past 2 a.m. and James followed Brandon in costume back to the bedroom and shut the door. Let me help you with your sack. They got into bed together and eventually went to sleep. Christmas morning came and of course the girls woke up first. They weren't allowed to open gifts without their dads, but they couldn't wait to watch the footage and see Santa for real. As James entered the living room yawning, he heard them giggling and watching the video. He was the last one up. Brandon brought him a cup of coffee, planting a warm kiss on his cheek. Honey, it worked. Huh? We got Santa on video. No way. And we have so many presents. Way too many presents. And there's even more downstairs. Who told you there were more presents in the basement, silly? Nobody told us. We saw his helper bring more presents in. You saw? What are you talking about? There's even more presents in the basement. We were so good this year, they ran out of room by the tree. Brandon nearly ripped the iPad out of Christy's hands. We got so many presents. What was she talking about? He tried to rewind the video, but the tablet was nearly dead. He handed it to James, who took it into the office in a rush. It only took a minute to load the footage, but James was frozen with anxiety. Finally, it loaded. He clicked through, estimating the timing. There were a few hours of nothing after the girls went to bed. And then at 1.32 a.m., Brandon enters the camera dressed as Santa. In the grainy footage, he looks really convincing. He delivers the presents, eats the cookies, and leaves. But a few minutes later, someone else entered the screen. A shorter, then stranger bundled up in wintered clothes tiptoed into the room eyeing the gifts. He had a long, scraggly white beard that matched the hair spilling out from under his winter cap. In the shadows, he had almost no facial features other than the point of his thin nose. Over his shoulder was what looked like a garbage bag. He stood there in the center of the room for several moments before stepping forward and removing a cookie from the plate. He sniffed it with a strange curiosity and then took a bite. He put the rest of the cookie back down on the plate. Brandon! He rushed into the room as James rewound the footage to show him what he had just witnessed. 
He hoped to God that he was just seeing things. But Brandon clasped his hands over his mouth at a total loss for words. Who the fuck is that? I think he came in through the laundry room. James, we never fixed that lock. He was trembling. James, fast forward the footage. He did, without question. Skimming quickly as the sun came up and the girls entered the living room excitedly in their Christmas pajamas. Ashley fetched the iPad to play the video while Christy helped herself to the rest of the cookie that the stranger had bitten. And then it hit them. James, we never saw him leave. The fathers panicked, rushing back into the living room. They didn't have a plan, they just wanted to get the girls out of the house. But as they rounded the corner, it was already too late. The girls had gone down into the basement. Santa Cam, written by Brian Renaud, told by Shannon Lee Weber, featuring Aaron Holland, Ashlyn C. Hafer, Brian Renaud, and Shannon Lee Weber. John, a young man of 26, was free from work, ready to skate and ski in the Alps and celebrate the new year. He occupied the top floor in one of those old, gaunt houses in which the rooms are large and lofty. The floor below his own was vacant and unfurnished, and below that were other lodgers whom he did not know. It was cheerless, and he looked forward heartily to a change. He was catching the morning boat and planned to pack before getting a good night's sleep. As he filled his suitcase with clothes, the snaps broke off and fell to the floor. He had known it was deteriorating, but had expected it to last through one more trip. Now he realized he had made a terrible mistake. It was getting late, and he'd have to rush to make it to the store before it closed for the evening. Only a few blocks away from home was a second-hand shop. John entered, taking in the warmth, and was greeted by the assistant. I'm looking for a suitcase, the largest one you have. The clerk took him to the back corner, where there was one large suitcase on display, well outside of John's price range. Is there any room to haggle? The clerk laughed. We close in five minutes. John panicked and looked around the shop, finding nothing in his price range that would do. Please, sir, I'm leaving on a trip in the morning, and my suitcase just came apart moments ago. Any bag, do you have anything less expensive that I could purchase? The clerk sighed deeply. Please, there's nowhere else for me to go tonight. I'd have to delay my trip. The clerk disappeared into the back, where John could hear him shuffling around. After a few moments, he came out with a large brown canvas duffel. Just came in. Good bones, but pretty dirty. Wanted to clean it up before putting it out. How much? It was less than half the cost of the suitcase, and the clerk gave an additional discount for the dirt and grime. As John left the store, the clerk turned off the lights behind him. Now go, and enjoy your holiday. John was thrilled. 
In just 30 hours, he'd be nearing the brilliant sunshine of the high Alps in winter. The night was cheerless. It was miserable, and few people were about. A cold, sleety rain was driving down the streets before the ice-cold wind followed, howling dismally among the big, gloomy houses, and when he reached his home, he could still hear the whistling wind beyond his windows. He passed his landlady, shielding a candle from the drafts with her thin hand. I'll be going abroad in the morning for ten days, Mrs. Monks, if you don't mind collecting my letters. She winked at him. Well, I hope you have a happy new year, sir, and better weather than this. I hope so, too. He shivered as he ascended the stairs. The sleet volleyed against the window panes. He put his kettle on to make a cup of hot coffee and then set about packing. He liked the packing as it brought the snowy mountains so vividly before him. For the first time, he took a long look at his recent purchase. The bag was not elaborate in nature. A stout canvas kit bag, sack-shaped, with holes around the neck for a brass bar and padlock. Empty, it was shapeless and not much to look at. But its capacity was unlimited, and he was thrilled that he wouldn't have to pack carefully. He shoved his coat, cap, gloves, and skates into the bag, followed by climbing boots, sweaters, snow boots, and earmuffs. On top of these, he added piles of woolen shirts and underwear, followed by thick socks. His suit was next, in case there was a fancy dinner at the hotel, and then he paused for a moment to reflect. It was after ten o'clock, and a furious gust of wind rattled the windows as though to hurry him. He thought of the poor people he'd leave behind to spend their new year in such a climate, while he was skimming over snowy slopes in bright sunshine, dancing with rosy-cheeked girls. That reminded him. He must pack his dancing shoes and evening socks. He crossed the room to the cupboard when he heard soft footsteps on the stairs. He paused for a moment, listening. It was Mrs. Monks, he thought. But then the steps ceased suddenly, and he heard no more. They must have been two flights down, he thought, and they belonged to a late lodger. John went back to his bedroom and packed his pumps and dress shirts into the bag. By now, the duffel was two-thirds full and stood upright on its own like a sack of flour. The clerk had mentioned it was dirty, but only now did John see how old and ratty it truly was, faded and worn, obviously subjected to rather rough treatment. As he continued packing, John occasionally thought again about the footsteps down below. From time to time, he was almost certain he heard the soft tread of someone paddling over the floorboards, and they seemed to be getting nearer. For the first time in his life, John felt true creepiness. He had left the room for something, and as he returned, he noticed the top of the bag had lopped over with the extraordinary resemblance of a human face. The canvas fell into a fold like a nose and forehead, and the brass rings for the padlock filled the position of the eyes. A shadow, or possible stain he couldn't tell exactly, looked like tangled hair. I shall be glad of a change of scenery, he thought to himself. In the sitting room, however, he was not pleased to hear again that stealthy tread upon the stairs, and to realize it was much closer than before as well as unmistakably real. This time, he got up and went to see who it could be at so late an hour, but the sound ceased and there was no one on the stairs. He went to the floor below, not without trepidation, and turned on the electric light to make sure that no one was hiding in the vacant rooms. All empty, only shadows. He called over the banisters to Mrs. Monks, but there was no answer, and his voice echoed down into the dark vault of the house and was lost in the roar of the gale that howled outside. Everyone was in bed and asleep. Everyone except himself and the owner of these mysterious footsteps. My absurd imagination, I suppose, he thought. It must have been the wind after all, although it seemed so very real and close. He went back to his packing. It was getting on towards midnight. He drank his coffee up and lit another pipe, the last before turning in. With something of a start, John suddenly realized that he felt nervous, oddly nervous. It was a singular and curious malaise that had come over him, and he hardly knew what to make of it. He felt as though he were doing something he knew to be wrong. Yet, though he searched vigorously and honestly in his mind, he could nowhere lay his finger upon the secret of this growing uneasiness, and it perplexed him. More, it distressed and frightened him. 
Pure nerves, I suppose, he said aloud with a forced laugh. Mountain air will cure all that, he added, still speaking to himself. And that reminds me, my snow glasses. As he passed quickly towards the sitting room to fetch them from the cupboard, he saw out of the corner of his eye the indistinct outline of a figure standing on the stairs. It was someone a few steps down from the top. They were in a stooping position, with one hand on the banisters and the face peering up towards the landing. John had found the source of the footsteps. Who in the world could it be, and what did he want? John caught his breath sharply and stood still. Then, after a few seconds' hesitation, he found his courage and turned to investigate. The stairs were empty. He felt a series of cold shivers run over him, and something about the muscles of his legs gave a little and grew weak. For the space of several minutes, he peered steadily into the shadows that congregated at the top of the staircase. Then he walked fast, almost ran into the light of the front room. As he passed inside the doorway, he heard someone come up the stairs behind him and go into his bedroom. It was a heavy footstep, but stealthy, the tread of somebody who did not wish to be seen. That was someone on the stairs then, he muttered, his flesh crawling all over. And whoever it was has now gone into my bedroom. His delicate, pale face turned absolutely white, and for some minutes he hardly knew what to think or do. Finally, he went into the other room, where a few seconds before the steps had disappeared. Mrs. Monks? The words fell dead against the curtains in a room that held no other figure than his own. Who's there? he called. What do you want here? The curtains swayed very slightly, and as he saw it, his heart felt as if it almost missed a beat. He dashed forward and drew them aside with a rush. A window, streaming with rain, was all that met his gaze. He continued his search, but in vain. The cupboards held nothing but clothes, and there was no one under the bed. He stepped backwards into the middle of the room, and as he did so, he nearly tripped over the large duffel bag. A few moments before, it had surely been on his right, between the bed and the bathroom, and he did not remember moving it. What in the world was the matter with everything? A terrific gust of wind tore at the windows, dashing the sleet against the glass. He came to his senses. There's no one here, that's quite clear. Yet even as he said it, he knew perfectly well that he did not believe the words himself. He felt like someone was hiding close, watching him. He went back into the front room, poking the fire into a blaze, and sat down to think. Outwardly, John remained calm, pretending to the very last that everything he witnessed had a natural explanation or was merely delusions of his tired nerves. But inwardly, in his very heart, he knew all along that someone had come up the stairs and gone into the bedroom. He began humming, a bit too loud to be natural, and crossed into his room when he felt every hair on his head stand up. The bag was right in front of him, several feet closer than before, and over the crumpled top he saw a head and face slowly shrinking down and out of sight. He was certain he heard breathing. Who's there? He had found his voice, though it was just a whisper. He stepped forward so that he could see all round and over the bag. Of course, there was nothing there. Nothing but the faded carpet and the bulging canvas sides. He put out his hands and threw open the mouth of the sack where it had fallen over, only being three parts full. And then he saw for the first time that round the inside, some six inches from the top, there ran a broad smear of dull crimson. It was an old and faded blood stain. He uttered a scream and drew back his hands as if they had been burnt. At the same moment, the bag unmistakably lurched towards the door. John collapsed back, searching for the support of something solid, and the door, being further behind him than he realized, received his weight just in time to prevent his falling, and shut with a resounding bang. His left arm hit the light switch and the room went dark. He groped furiously for the knob to turn the light on again, but the rapid closing of the door had set the coats hanging on it swinging, and his fingers became entangled in a confusion of sleeves and pockets, so it was several moments before he found the switch. And in those moments of terror, two things happened that sent him over the boundary into the region of genuine horror. He distinctly heard the kit bag shuffling heavily across the floor, and close in front of his face sounded like the heavy breathing of a human being. 
In his efforts to find the button on the wall, he nearly scraped the nails from his fingers, and then he realized he dreaded the return of the light. It might be better for him to stay in the merciful screen of darkness, but he yielded to the original desire and the room was flooded again with light. But the second instinct had been right. It would have been better to stay in the shelter of darkness, for there, right before him, Bending over the half-packed bag stood a tall, bulging figure, greasy and pale in the merciless glow of the electric light. John felt a disturbing familiarity. Not three feet from him, the monster of a man stood, tangled black hair sprawling from his scalp. John attempted to grope the door handle, but the man lifted his devil's face and looked straight at him. My bag... John finally clawed the door open and fell into a heap on the landing, knocking his head against the floorboards and going unconscious. It was still dark when he opened his eyes, and he realized he was lying stiff and bruised on the cold boards. The memory of what he had seen rushed back into his mind, and he nearly fainted again. Could it all have been a dream? He crawled to the front room as the wintry dawn began to peep at the windows, and covered himself with an overcoat in the armchair and fell asleep for several hours. What? You ain't been to bed, sir? Mrs. Monks had come up the stairs, making a great clamor. Before he could answer, she continued. Well, there's an urgent gentleman here to see you, though it ain't eight o'clock yet. Who is it? Says he's an officer. Show him up at once, please. John's head was whirling, and his mind was still full of dreadful visions. The officer apologized for the early visit and explained that a terrible mistake had been made. We don't know how, but the bag disappeared from the courthouse and ended up at the shop that you went to last night. We've been tracking it down, and the shop owner sent us to you. John didn't understand. Why would the bag have been in the courthouse? This bag was evidence in the Turk case. The Turk case? John went cold. In a flash, he realized what it all meant. The monster he had seen had been David Turk, who recently got off for murder due to insanity. The dirty and much-used bag, the smear of crimson within the top, the dreadful stretched condition of the bulging sides. He remembered how Turk stuffed the victim's body into a canvas bag for burial the ghastly, dismembered fragments forced into this very bag, and the bag produced itself as evidence. The shop owner was awful upset about it, sir, and told me to come over first thing this morning with this, as you'll be leaving soon. The officer pointed to the large suitcase John originally had his eye on, but he couldn't find his voice. Finally, he said, If you can unpack the bag for me, just empty the things onto the floor. He gestured to the bedroom, and the officer went inside for several minutes. John could hear the shifting and rattle of items being unpacked. Thank you, sir. He had returned with the large bag folded over his arm. Is there anything else I can do? No, thank you. I'm happy to help in any way. I wanted to see him get put away for a long time. The officer looked back with pained eyes. I guess it was just a nightmare, like some part of myself knew it was his bag. I thought I saw him last night. The officer chuckled, though it felt forced. He hesitated for a moment. You couldn't have seen him last night. Turk poisoned himself right after release. John's blood ran cold. Poisoned? What time did he do it? About ten o'clock. John's eyes landed on the old canvas bag. Most disturbing is, he left a note. Said he wanted the same treatment as the woman he killed. He wanted to be buried in this same bag.
Duffel Bag, story by Algernon Blackwood, adapted and told by Brian Renaud, featuring Aaron Holland and Shannon Lee Weber.